Her dissertation research focuses on the spatialized history of the Whitney Museum of American Art, exploring the intersection of art and architecture in the context of cultural institutions. Lauren's lightning talk today is titled Before Whitney and the Discursive Capacity of Exhibiting Architecture. So I will hand over to you now, Lauren. Thank you so much. And I will share my screen. <clears throat> Right. Is everyone able to see that? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so a major expansion of the Whitney Museum of American Art was announced on the front page of the New York Times on May 22nd, 1985. Along with the description of the project's ambitious program, the feature included a photograph of a physical model foregrounding the proposed edition designed by Michael Graves. <clears throat> the high contrast image included very little urban context, emphasizing the expansion's composition of historical architectural fragments that had come to be recognized as Graves' signature aesthetic, looming over the Whitney's existing Marcel Breuer design building. While some critics praised the proposal, the timing of the project initiated just prior to the existing Breuer building's eligibility for historic landmark status, quickly raised a broad-based ire across New York architecture enthusiasts, designers, and preservationists who felt the project was an affront to Marcel Breuer's modernist architectural legacy. The singular snapshot of the proposed exterior was widely republished in the popular and design press nationally, reducing the project to a proxy for a larger emerging divide between modernists and what was deemed postmodernist aesthetics making the project a symbol for the perceived threat to the stability of the architectural canon constructed during the previous four decades. <clears throat> in response to the ongoing debate regarding the Graves design, the independent arts organization Storefront for Art and Architecture publicized an open call for participation in an exhibition entitled Before Whitney. Creating a public forum dedicated to the project, Storefront saw a crowdsourced exhibition as a means to circumvent the perceived secretive process of architectural design and institutional decision-making. Each exhibition entrant was provided a base image to work from. Organizers excised both the Graves design and the Breuer Whitney from the image of Madison Avenue, asserting that erasing both buildings neutralized what had been a hotly debated image and leaving the site more fully open to reinterpretation. The curatorial choice to erase the Whitney's architecture was also an attempt to shift the debate away from the binary acceptance or rejection of modernist or postmodernist proclivities vis-a-vis -vis either the Graves or the Breuer building, instead challenging the Whitney's permanence and stature as a major art world organization. 75 crowdsourced contributions from artists across the US were displayed with responses to the exhibition's open-ended prompt ranging widely. A significant number, predominantly authored by the designers local to New York and presumably more familiar with the existing museum, critiqued Storefront's removal of the Breuer building from the site as a denial of the material reality of the Whitney. One submission challenged the size of the expansion, imploring the Whitney to reconsider the scope of the program. Others question the structures of cultural production and representation foundational to the museum as a traditional institutional entity. A smaller handful proposed new institutional typologies to foster more diverse artistic practices in the city. Although Storefront had ambitiously set the stage for a presumably more productive public debate about architecture, cultural institutions, and their future trajectory, the mediation of the exhibition through images of the exterior of the project also undercut these aspirations. The call for participation ultimately relied on the same modes of aesthetic judgment that Storefront had critiqued. As a result, the modernist versus postmodernist binary was redoubled in many of the submissions, leaving before Whitney, like the proposal and much of the architectural profession of the time, preoccupied by the unresolvable and limited discourse of stylistic choice, rather than exploring the potential for institutional reform relevant to both the museum and the discipline of architecture more broadly. In the decade that followed, Graves produced numerous interpretation re in iterations of the expansion proposal, but the design remained deeply polarizing in the eyes of the public, critical press, and ultimately the donors fun funding the project, which led to the abandonment of the project in the early 1990s. 
From our contemporary perspective, the current Whitney, located in a Renzo piano building anchoring the High Line, was unimaginable in the heat of the debate surrounding the Graves' proposal. The current state of the Whitney reveals what's been most consistent about the museum and its entanglement with architecture. In avoiding allegiances to any singular representative architectural style, the Whitney has projected a vision of American culture predicated on change, strategically using architecture and its exhibitionary capacity as a means of advancing its agenda. And as such, there's no promise the Whitney won't use architecture to reinvent itself once again. Lauren, Thank can I just you. tell, are you doing slides? Because we've only seen the one holding slides. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. no. I don't know why those weren't all visible. Yes, I did have slides. Oh, do you but... want to just quickly run, um, run through them? Or... Yeah, you're only seeing the first one? Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Well, um, did you, let's see. <clears throat> can you... I'll just stop sharing and try resharing again. I'm sorry about that so much. Can you see this now? Yeah, that looks, yeah, so. Okay, so this was the first slide of the original announcement about the Whitney um, expansion in the New York Times. This is the call for participation from Storefront. This is the image that entrance to the exhibition were given as a base drawing to work from. And some examples of what submissions looked like. And ultimately how the Graves project kind of had to evolve in the course of this discourse and debate around its design. And then what the Whitney currently looks like. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for starting us off and sorry about the uh, problems with the, with the slides, but thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Parita Upadhyaya. Parita recently finished her final year research thesis titled The Absurdity of the Deconstructivist Exhibition, which will also be the subject of her talk today. Uh, she studied at CEPT University in Ahmedabad in India, and her work is interested in a theoretical and academic practice of architecture, paired with her shared interest in literature and philosophy. So I will hand over to you, Preeta. Hello. Hi. Is my screen visible? Yes, we can see that. Thank you. And it's uh, shifting as I change. Yep. All right, great. Okay, so yes, um, I'm Parita, and uh, I'm going to be talking about the uh, 1988's uh, Deconstructivist Exhibition at MoMA and how it provided a center stage to radical radicalized architectural thinking that was being conducted in the fringes of the profession at the time. Um, the most striking thing about the curation was it uh, referred to Russian constructivism and deconstruction uh, from the fields of art and literature outside the domain of architecture. Um, the curation was heavily politicized and critiqued for being exclusionary, for misrepresentation of ideas and architectural work, and for being extremely form-oriented with no consideration of spatiality or other important architectural markers. Uh, the exhibition was built around and showcased the cultural and intellectual climate of New York, but uh, most importantly adhered to its uh, consumerist and capitalist tendencies. Uh, it supported the political conveniences of the involved agencies uh, that overshadowed the political passion of the works and ideas being exhibited. Um, however, it is the same consumerist inclinations of the time that turned architecture into image. And because of the image, it eventually propagated the ideas that hadn't gained attention in the mainstream practice of architecture. I am briefly going to talk about the impacts of the exhibition, um, the impacts exhibition had in spite of it uh, not always being received well, even by the participant architects themselves. Uh, the impacts are twofold. One of providing limelight to the marginal practices and methodologies and tools used in the practice, 
at the time, just because anything MoMA would showcase would be recognized and upheld. And the other of opening up uh, an avenue of discourses in architecture that drew from fields such as humanities and social sciences. Um, the first impact is on the production of discourse and role of theory in architecture. Um, this was the only exhibition uh, in the series of five exhibitions at MoMA that displayed work of a group of people and focused on theory rather than individuated architectural work. It exhibited not only architectural theories, but theories borrowed from other fields into architecture, as I've previously mentioned, uh, deconstruction for that exam for that matter. Hence, it no more treated theory as subsidiary to the act of building itself. Uh, on the on one hand, the projects portrayed the application of these uh, theories and conceptualization of architecture and questioned the architecture elements themselves. And on the other hand, it boosted theoretical production of the 60s and 70s and the philosophical ideas of difference, continuity, and fold uh, swept across and swept into architecture. Um, the exhibition gave rise to unprecedented publication and theoretical forums in its way. One of the most interesting examples being the NE, Architectural New York Conferences. So these were a series of 10 multidisciplinary and cross-cultural conference um, held at sites around the globe from 1991 to 2000. It had people coming in from varied disciplines to, uh, to explore different themes based on uh, architectural definitions of 10 compound any words, like anywhere, anyone, and so on. Uh, the result of each conference uh, the book was the books compiled by the same name uh, with the participant papers and edited transcripts of the discussions most of these conferences had participant architects those of the exhibitions uh, ex of the deconstructivist exhibition as guests speakers or hosts themselves the second imp uh, impact was that it had in use of digital technology in architecture Eisenman and Pri, two of the participant architects, were conflicted on their respective projects being the first exploration of computer-aided design then. Pri maintained that uh, the 3D mapping on the rooftop modeling uh, in 1983 was the first primitive step, whereas Eisenman maintained that digital design started with his biocenter project. And once it was there, a lot of ar architects quickly adapted to the ways of digital designing. Hence, digital technology started becoming an integral part of designing, ranging from conceptualization to experimentation, iteration, and impl eventually implementation as we know now. The third impact is on the way architecture was represented and how it became different from the building. Since image became more important in a consumerist culture, so did the communication of it. And with digital technology, new ways of drawing and representation emerged. The drawings had maze-like intricacy uh, resulting from the process of layering, juxtaposing, superimposing uh, elevations, exonometries, and plans in a combination of different views that encapsulates project's core idea into a conceptual collage. The role of drawing became to represent the textuality of architecture from uh, representing a building, if we consider it the modern times. Eisenman summarizes what I am trying to say here. He says, uh, the real architecture only exists in buildings. The real building exists outside the drawings. And uh, the difference here is that architecture and building are not the same. And finally, it had a significant impact on the way architecture was taught. Shumi, who was one of the participant uh, architects, was appointed Dean of the Columbia University in 1988. And in 1991, he spearheaded a paperless studio that rethought the pedagogy of architectural education and brought the digital revolution in architecture. The digital softwares from across the fields, aerospace, cinematography, fluid dynamics, were brought in to explore the multidisciplinarity of the profession of architecture. This combined with the multiple ways of representation revolutionized uh, architectural education and allowed uh, architectural knowledge to be extended to the other disciplines like that of filmmaking, for example. Hence, uh, although critique the exhibition validated the multiple ways architecture was being explored and exp experimented during the time, it cultivated a new audience for arch architectural experimentation and an original language for communicating this, as well as an academic audience which revelled in the autonomous space of architectural theorization. It questioned and disrupted the existing relationship of art and architecture, architecture and building, and museum and exhibition, and open up new avenues and themes for discussion on and around uh, architecture. Yes. Yes. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Farita. Um, our next speaker is Isabella um, de Aureo Caradelesco. Sorry. Isabella is an undergraduate student in design at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And her research consists of studying the involvement of the Art Deco movement in the city of Sao Paulo through analysis of magazines, exhibitions, private collections, and other academic sources. So I will hand over to you now, Isabella. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now, just a second. Okay. Is everything okay? Are you seeing my screen? Yep, that all looks good. Okay. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Isabella, and today I'm gonna present uh, Sorry. And today I'm going to present a comparison between the, between the reception of Art Deco in two different American countries, which are the USA and Brazil. I would also like to apologize for any mistake I might make in pronunciation or writing, although I understand English and I use it to producing content in this language. So I appreciate your patience and I think we can start now. Um, my research aims to identify the presence of Art Deco in Sao Paulo, mostly through the analysis of the Mirante das Artes, etc. magazine, which was a cultural magazine produced by the end of the 60s. But today I'm going to share a little bit about the exposition history in Sao Paulo and New York by the Museum of Modern Art. So before I can present the overview of the two countries' history of exhibitions involving Art Deco, I would like to talk a little about the similarities and difference of the style in these different locations. As you know, Art Deco is a French movement, but it gained popularity around the world to the late 1920s and 30s. Both in the USA and Brazil, the style incorporated a cosmopolitan aesthetic. In the USA, the Art Deco production went through two phases, one related with the French movement itself, and other inspired by the German early century production, focused on the functional design and mass production. The first gene, while more iconic, was weakened after the impacts of the Great Depression. And in Brazil, the style is known by its diversity, which englobes indigenous, historic, modern, and European reference. The main inspiration for the style in the country was the French exhibition in 1925. And the French experience played by modernist artists and scholars, such as Regina Gomes de Grasse, who was one of the first and most productive Brazilian decorative artists. And I also took the liberty to include in this slide a uh, work of Tarsila do Amaral, who I think is one of the most well-known Brazilian artists abroad. And although Tarsila is not an Art Deco producer herself, she was also impacted by the French experience producing art at the same time the Art Deco came to Brazil. So I think it's a good way to contextualize when the Art Deco came to the country. And as we can observe, the movement was heavily undefined, often associated with other modernist productions, so in the USA, we have the use of some terms like art modern, modern, French modern style. In Brazil, we have very similar terms like arte decorativa moderna, which means modern decorative art or art funcional, which is functional art. And only by the 60s, oops, sorry. <laughs> only by the 60s, the style uh, earned its, uh, its own name affecting on its perception and study. And one factor that is crucial to my research is the secondary position posed to the style, principally in Brazil. There is many reasons to why this happens, some of them being the association of the style with an elite and European only production, the subjugation of the decorative arts in the history of art and design in general, and even the perception of the decorative arts as a feminine making, therefore inferior, and to base this talking on expograph elements, I took one museum and one particular collection. 
For the North American excursion, the Museum of Modern Art was selected, primarily because of its great influence on the study and production of art and design among the decades. And for Brazil, I choose to observe the expographic history of the Adolfo and Fulvia Lehner's collection, which is one of the most important collection of decorative arts in the country. So by organizing the history of exhibitions of Art Deco in the, in the Museum of Modern Art and of the collection Lehner in general, it is possible to initialize an investigation of the process of the incorporation of the style by canonical study over the decades. Um, one highlight of this comparison is the beginning of exhibitions in each country. In both, you can see that it took some time for the Art Deco style to appear officially in the exhibitions. In the Museum of Modern Art, the first exhibition that contained artifacts today considered part of the style was in 1936, while the style had already appeared in the National's productions by the end of the 1920s decade. And in Brazil, this chronological distance is even more apparent. Although the private collection had started by the middle 50s, it only gained relevance within the style by the 1970s, boosted by two exhibitions at the Sao Paulo Museum of Art, which is one of the most important cultural institutions in the country. And we can perceive that while the exhibitions of the team in Brazil had just started, in the USA an increase occurred. By the end of the 60s, the revival of Art Deco happened, motivated by a French exhibition in 1966. So that justified the, uh, the increase of interest. And another interesting factor is that by the 19s, the Brazilian exhibition started to reach the North Americans, surpassing them by the new millennium. In 2001, the collection was shown for the first time abroad. And this most recent interest by the decorative arts in Brazil is part of a rethinking of the modernist history in general in the country, focusing on productions that were formerly subjugated. And lastly, it's interesting to, to observe that while in Brazil terms associated with modernism were highly used to describe the exhibits, in the USA, the style is often associated with exhibitions focused on the daily production and culture of the time. And at the Turris, two exhibitions in the Museum of Modern Art were important for the modernist and Art Deco reception, although they are not listed by the Museum of Modern Art as Art Deco's expositions themselves. And they are Objects 1900 and Today and Machine Art. And they show it at the time the aesthetics of machine and mass production. And in case of the 1900 and today particularly, it showed a comparison between the production at the time and the honor production of the beginning of the century. In Brazil, the first exhibition of Art Deco, of Art Deco artifacts was exposed then among other modernist styles, being that the modernist times happened at the same time as a Bauhaus exhibition on the other floor of the museum promoting a conversation between the movements. So as we can see, while the Brazilian expograph circuit tends to value Art Deco as a part of its modernist diversity, the USA presents the style as part of a period associated not only with the art history, but also with the mass production and daily life. And although this is an early stage analysis, I think it's interesting to analyze the history and perception of the style through the exhibition history. And I thank you for this opportunity of research and I make myself available for any questions or contributions. Thanks e obrigada. Thank you so much, Isabella. Um, I should just say, if anyone does have any questions, please pop them in the chat and then we'll just get to them at the end. But because I realize there's quite a lot of talks one after the other, so you may um, have a question at the time. So just pop it in the chat and we'll, we'll get to them um, after everyone has given their paper. Um, our next speaker is Portia Silva, who will be discussing Displaying Plasticity, the Exhibition Design of Everlasting Plastics. Portia is a second year MA art history student at Case Western Reserve University, and her research is interested in modern and contemporary arts, focusing on decolonial, eco-critical and gender theories. She was a 2023 summer intern for the US Pavilion Exhibition at the Venice Architecture Biennale, supported by the Peggy Guggenheim Collection. So I'll hand over now to Portia. 
Thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, everyone see that now? Yep, that looks like it's working. Yes, and should be able to see the, the change too. Um, the Everlasting Plastics exhibit is currently on display in the United States Pavilion at the 2023 Architecture Venice Biennale. I will specifically dis discuss the design features of Everlasting Plastics as the mediator between the physical experience of visitors and the conceptual interrogation of plastic as a material as presented in the works of the exhibition. Um, and this is done by creating a factory exhibit or factory aesthetic with, with the exhibition design. This talk draws on my experience from the summer um, and is in the context of an ongoing research project. The exhibition design interrogates how people move through the built space of the pavilion. The Everlasting Plastics curators, Tiziana Baldinebro and Lauren Levin, and the exhibition designers, Faisal Alton Bozar and Chloe Mukunbeck, work together to create a holistic and sustainable approach by avoiding single use plastic in their design. Um, conversations with the artists and architects who contributed the works created um, a factory aesthetic as they were thinking about where plastic is created and located in our world. The visitors encounter the ex exhibit first in the courtyard of the pavilion and are immediately confronted with this industrial aesthetic. Plastic industrial grade welding curtains hang on the front, front face of the entrance, interrupting the neoclassical facade of the pavilion itself and creating an intentional conflict by setting plastic against this traditional red brick building. The curtains are juxtaposed with bright assemblages that feature recycled plastic objects by conceptual artist Lauren Yeager, as you can see here in the courtyard. The sculptures set against the curtains immediately draw the viewer's attention to the multifaceted aspects of plastic, um, as well as the industrial timeline from crude material to commodity. Also in the courtyard are metal benches with plastic rollers. As you can see here, the black plastic rollers themselves spin, referencing industrial methods of plastic production. There are also steel ramps with a tread um, that draws upon an industrial vocabulary. The ramps in the pavilion are also necessary to provide accessibility as the existing pavilion only has stairs. Inside the exhibit itself, the curtains and benches echo the courtyard design. In between the five rooms of the pavilion, a double set of curtains act as a visual barrier between each room and the different works presented, as you can see here on the left of this photo. Passing through the curtains facilitates a strong sensory experience. The stiff plastic strips hit against each other and create noises. There's a strong plastic smell and visitors can feel the smooth rubbery texture while moving through the curtains and also experience changes in light and color. After the exhibition, the curtains will be donated to factories for use to reduce plastic waste. Inside the exhibition, the benches are specifically designed to invite human interaction, providing a moment of rest, but also inviting movement through the rollers. It was not uncommon to see visitors, especially children, spinning the rollers as fast as they could, which also created loud noises in the space, interrupting the traditional quiet and sterile gallery aesthetic. The didactics shown here are used to communicate written information about the exhibit and are printed on steel plates instead of using plastic acrylic lettering. This also reduces plastic waste in the exhibition and again contributes to the design of a factory and industrial aesthetic. The curtains, ramps, benches, and didactics create a multi-sensorial aspect through the sights, smells, sounds, and textures throughout the exhibition. These elements implicate the viewer in their consumption and use of plastic while simultaneously challenging traditional design um, in an exhibition by centering sustainability. Additionally, the creation of this factory aesthetic facilitates conceptual and mimetic ties to the works presented in the exhibition. For example, in this photo, Simon Anton, a designer from Detroit, is pictured with his works that use discarded plastic from toy and automobile factories in the city of Detroit. Works throughout the exhibition represent plastic in every stage of production from conception to finished consumer items. Scholar Max Liberon has characterized the impact of plastic production and the environmental impact of, of plastic as a form of modern colonization, as the environmental and health consequences are disproportionate for different groups of people. They write that the idea of plastic disposability assumes access to land. 
it assumes that household waste will be picked up and taken to landfills or recycling plants that allow plastic disposables to go away. Without this infrastructure and access to land, indigenous land, there's no disposability. As everlasting plastic attempts to reckon with the effects of plastic consumption in human lives, it does so within the colonial structure of the Venice Biennale, which disproportionately gives space to countries from the global north. The overarching question that I will continue to explore my research is whether the potential positive impacts of the exhibition by bringing attention to the plastic crisis outweigh the participation within a colonial structure. Additionally, I will weigh the environmental impacts of the exhibition and the design, even when efforts are made to mitigate those impacts in the context of ethical and sustainable curation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Portia. And uh, next up we have um, Chloe Henry. Chloe is a graduate student at the Sorbonne University in Paris. She's currently completing a master's degree in English studies specializing in American history. Her research focuses on the influence of fashion in the context of social movements and in the construction of identities in the 20th century. And today Chloe's paper is titled The Black Fashion Museum. Thank you very much. Um... Let me know if you can see everything. Does it work? Yes, that's working. Perfect. So uh, in this conversation of displaying designs, um, I want to talk about what have failed to be displayed in the previous decades uh, or centuries, um, and which is the place of Black fashion in fashion exhibition and fashion museum and in the preservation of textile in general. Um, and I'm going to talk about the Black Fashion Museum, as I think it's a good starting point in this conversation. Um, starting by talking about the main character of this museum, Louis K. Alexander Lane, who was the founder, but also a great woman who did a lot of things in order to preserve, restore, and just uh, promote Black fashion. Her name has kind of disappeared from history book, which is a shame. She's, she was really incredible. Um, in 1963, uh, she wrote her master's thesis at the age of 47 um, on uh, the role of the Negro in retelling in New York City from 1863 to the present. This is a really important um, point in her life because she wrote it after a teacher told her that Black people had not contributed to uh, the fashion world, uh, which was obviously untrue, but was a uh, thinking that was just accepted as fact, and she didn't want to accept it as fact. She actually wanted, um, and here I quote, to dispel, dispel the myth the myth that black people did not contribute to fashion history. Uh, in 1966, she opens the Harlem Institute of Fashion in Harlem, shock. And um, uh, there she gave classes, free classes to the black community in Harlem to obviously learn how to sew and design, but a lot of other courses. So there's a lot of newspaper giving a lot of like, all the courses, but they kind of all don't agree with each other. But there was apparently also teaching mathematics and physics and grooming and fashion history. So we see the first hint um, of needing to preserve or at least share a history that is spot gone. Um, but this institute was basically to give independence and autonomy to a community um, that did not necessarily have a lot of open doors um, in the fashion world and give them also the codes of what is it like to dress proper, etc. Uh, in 1979, she continued what she had started with the fashion history class uh, in the Institute, and she opened the Black Fashion Museum in Harlem on 126th Street. Um, and in 1982, she wrote her book, Black in the History of Fashion. So you can see that Louise K. Alexander Lane, throughout all her life, you have, like 
until she died, um, just spent her life dedicating, dedicated to preserving, restoring, and promoting Black fashion. And this is where the Black Fashion Museum comes in action. So I'm going to quote her. This is what is this something she said in a newspaper article in 77, so two years before the magazine, uh, the museum opened. And this was to explain why she did it, obviously. This was also to call for donation to build the collection of the museum. So she said, it's time we destroy the myth. Sorry. It's time we destroy the myth that black people are newfound talent in the fashion industry. We came to these shores as creative people and we still are. The ideas and creation of our mothers and grandmothers have been copied down through the ages without credit. We must now right the wrong that has been perpetrated perpetrated against people of African descent in the fashion business over the past 300 or so years. You can see a couple of pictures of uh, Miss Lane um, in the museum. Um, it might be in two different locations. The museum has been relocated a couple of years later in Washington. Um, so I, this, I chose three examples of dress that you could find in the museum um, that kind of showcase what was available and kind of the limits that the museum had to face. So you have a dress shown by Rosa Parks, who many people forget was a seamstress before she was an activist. Um, and this is a way for the museum to remind people that fashion is inherent to the to black history and that it is always somewhere in the background that you can always relate fashion to the black community somehow um in america a most a lot of slaves were um came with this uh, heritage of textile sewing and pass it down from generation to generation. This is how Mrs. Lane also learned how to sew. This is very organic. Um, so this is a good reminder of that. And um, on the right, you can see a dress designed by Anne Lowe, who was um, the designer. So she was a black woman. She was the designer behind Jenny Kennedy, uh, Jackie Kennedy's dress, wedding dress, um, who was very famous reproduced a law, but a lot of people forget that it, it was a black woman who did it. So this is, again, always in this need to replace black people in the narrative of fashion, where they have been excluded for so long and even um, made invisible purposefully um, because it did not suit a global narrative, if you've ever taken a fashion class, chances are you've only studied Europe or America and the rest of the world or everything else is ignored. So this is in response to that. Uh, in the middle, you can see a dress by, done by an enslaved woman in the 19th century. Um, and this is where you can really start to notice the challenges that the museum had. So this is the only dress made by, by an enslaved woman. And this is also one of the oldest dress that the museum collection had. Um, unfortunately, the museum was mostly constituted of um, contemporary dress that were given by the black designers while they were still alive. So there's a lot of Peter Davies dress that he gave himself because he was friend with Miss Lane. There's a lot of dress from Broadway, uh, from the, um, what's the name? Oz musical. Um, a lot of really, really recent dress because this is really, really hard. Textile is very fragile and often doesn't survive time and on top of that every dresses that was made by black people especially during colonialist time or during um slavery tend to have been 
forgotten, not documented, just burned down if needed. Um, it, it was not considered valued enough to be preserved. And so when the museum had to open, so two, two years even before opening, they started appearing in newspaper, Louis Alexander Lane and her husband touring America, asking a newspaper organizing show to get to financial donation, but also requesting people to just check in their closet if they might have something that need preservation that could be displayed, that could be preserved. And that was one of the biggest challenge the museum has to face. Um, unfortunately, the museum had to close down. Um, Ms. Lane passed away in 2007, if I'm not mistaken. And um, once again, the problem they had faced in having all those dresses uh, buried in closet, they had to face again because the, when the museum, when Mrs. Lane died, her daughter inherited the museum, but the founding were lacking and all the dresses had to be kept in very bad condition once again. Um, today, um, the museum closed and they gave the whole collection to um, the National Museum of African American history uh, in America. So thankfully all the dresses are preserved, but um, it's a good thing to remember that um, there is history that has been invisibilized and that it is always good to preserve. And hopefully if you have something in your closet, maybe go donate it to a museum, who knows? Thank you. Thank you so much, Chloe. And a reminder, if anyone has any questions, just please put them in the chat and we'll um, we'll talk them through later. Um, our next speaker is John Binchy. John is a student on the MA in History of Design programme at the Royal College of Art and the Victoria and Albert Museum. He's an Irish design and art history hist historian, sorry, interested in 19th and 20th century European cultural history with an emphasis on decoloniality within the museum space. So I will hand over to you, John. Uh, thank you, Alex, for that introduction. I'm just going to try to share my screen now. Can you all see that? Um, but yes. Um, and if I do this, can you still see? Can you see my notes or can you see the screen still? Well, we can just see the screen. Okay, and if I do this, it's still fine? Yeah. Okay, great. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so today I will be discussing a pivotal event within the world of design and the history of curation. Uh, that is the 1931 Colonial Exposition in Paris with a focus on a contemporaneous counter exhibition held by French surrealists and their contribution to uh, the to 1930s colonial and curatorial discourse. So with regard to the official Exposition Coloniale, uh, with an estimated 8 million visitors and running for a duration of about six months, um, this was an enormous effort on behalf of the French government, who at the time controlled the second largest empire in the world, um, to display these diverse cultures and the immense resources of France's colonial possessions. So designed as a tour of the world in one day, um, indigenous buildings were altered in scale and their elements were adapted and functioned by European architects for the exposition. However, despite the overwhelmingly positive public reaction to the Exposition Coloniale, uh, there were some dissenting voices that could be heard amidst this clamor of, I guess, this colonial fair, um, and these were voices that would eventually find common ground in a rarely studied counter exposition dubbed La Vérité sur les colonies, or The Truth About the Colonies, um, organized, as I said, by the French Surrealists as a formal and I suppose tangible boycott um, of the official exposition coloniale. So starting in 1925, with a pamphlet circulated in support of the rebels of the Rift Valley fighting um, in Morocco for independence from France, 
the surrealists actively adopted an anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist stance. And so during the 1920s and 30s, the surrealists regarded their paintings and writings not as aesthetic objects, but rather as catalysts for cultural change. So this counter exposition, although it contained no actual surrealist paintings, was in a way an ideal surrealist work. Uh, it was collective and dialectical while fusing political and psychological realms. Um, and because naming this, because naming the counter exposition, the truth about the colonies um, suggests an explicitly didactic lesson, um, it appears to somewhat unproblematically submit itself to the rules and parameters governing the realm of factual and I guess moral edification. But I think when examining this counter exposition uh, through a 21st century lens, um, surrealism's kind of uneasy relationship with colonialism and primitivism quickly becomes apparent. So the counter exposition, for example, uh, contained large African oceanic and Native American sculpture divisions, which, according to its organizers, was of an extent never before seen in Paris and came from, quote, the principal collectors of art from the colonized countries, uh, including several surrealists themselves, like André Breton and Paul Eloire. And then figure one, which you can see here, um, presents us with a display that critiques the role of Christian missionaries in French colonization and shows an ironic grouping of figurines, that is a bare-breasted native woman, um, and then an offering figure in the center in the guise of an African child holding uh, a collection bag inscribed Merci, and a uh, Madonna and child then on the right there, uh, whose physical appearance seems to have been Africanized. So the message of this exhibit was, I suppose, clear at the time that the superstitious uh, fetish worshippers were not the colonized people, as was the stereotype at the time, but rather the Christian missionaries with their gilded Madonnas and their bleeding crucifixes. Um, moreover, the superior artists were not Europeans with their bad taste and mass production, but uh, indigenous artists. So really this comparison kind of attempted to establish an equivalence, I suppose, between European and African fetishes, fetishes um, that contradicted the evolutionist hierarchies on which Western aesthetics depend. And then in the same room, um, according to a guidebook that was distributed to visitors at the entrance, these indigenous artifacts were to be interpreted in reference to an axiom uh, from Karl Marx, that is, a people that oppresses another cannot be free, which can be seen in French, uh, hung on a banner in figure two there. So this conjunction of primitive, so-called primitive um, objects, fetishes, and uh, texts curated by the surrealists kind of attempted to reorganize the visitor's understanding of the colonial reality and rendering it more complex. But as, as I said, I think today it's clear that the meanings, uh, for example, attributed to these objects were those of the exhibitions anti-capitalist and anti-clerical organizers. Um, and the native object was valuable to the surrealists only as a counter to Western convention, not of not of value in and of itself. So organizers of La Verité sur les colonies, uh, much like the French government and even the church, um, used art from the colonies uh, to advance their own ideological regime. And then added to this, the surrealists presented these so-called primitive uh, objects in a manner of a European museum and in isolation from their original contexts and as precious objects for visual evaluation. So I think as this uh, exhibition suggests, even the revolutionary modernism of the surrealists and um, curatorial practices can't be so neatly, I guess, extricated from the problematics of European cultural uh, imperialism. And I think that while this protest uh, provided an opportunity, at least in theory, to give a voice to colonized and suppressed peoples, um, it ultimately uh, reiterated many of these same dynamics of the actual colonial exposition.
So both of these events kind of raise, um, I think, complex and challenging questions, such as the politicization of the quote unquote primitive um, and what it means to collect an object, remove it from its original context and recontextualize it under different material conditions. Um, so yeah, thanks for everyone for listening to my lightning talk. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thanks so much, John. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Caitlin van Middelkoop, a PhD candidate at the University of Groningen. Her research interests include the position of making in the creative process, the influence of emerging technologies on the field of visual communication design, the changing role of the designer in a predominantly digital age di dictated by machines, as well as the speculative futures for and pasts of art and design education. And her paper today is titled Interchanging Worldviews, Recontextualizing the Self-Image of Design. Can you see my screen and yeah, all right. Uh, thank you for um, the introduction. Um, the two cases displaying design that I will compare uh, today, uh, they were designed 11 years apart in the fall semester of 2012 and the spring semester of 2023 um, with the use of different uh, software. Um, the latest project included um, runway ML's AI magic tools, uh, while the project in 2012 was just using plain old Photoshop and InDesign. Um, the first uh, case incorporates news photograph photographs obtained from the World Wide Web combined with visual documentation of design processes by students from Design Academy Eindhoven. And the second uh, case also uses images that were found online but now in combination with AI generated imagery, as well as images depicted on glass lantern slides from the cultural heritage collection of the Technical University in Delft. Um, here are some images from um, the publication, um, which was called A Year in Context. Um, and this is this 2012 project. It looks at unpublished publication. This is an unpublished publication, which was initiated um, and conceptualized and produced to provide a context for the graduation project of 97 Bachelor of Design and 31 Masters of Design graduates that were presented during the graduation show of the Design Academy in Eindhoven, uh, which is a showstopper of what is now the annual Dutch Design Week. The publication accompanied two other publications, a graduation show 2012 project directory and a set of thematic newspapers called titled Blended. Around that time, um, designers graduating from this particular design school were often seen as self-absorbed individuals operating almost autonomously with little or no connection to, let alone, relevance for the outside world. Two months prior to the start of the academic year 2011-2012, this issue of social relevance had been addressed by State Secretary for Education, Culture and Science, Hal Zelstra, in order for artists and designers or applied artists to remi remain eligible for government subsidies, the impact of their work and its meaning for society had become much more measure measurable. So as the curators and designers of the 2012 graduation show and its accompanying publications, it was our objective to present the 137 individual students' perspective as part of a larger, more meaningful whole. Although most of the concept behind the student project were presented in year in context were materialized between February and June of 2012, Many of the first ideas leading up to their final uh, form already came about earlier than this, engaging aspects of contemporary life in situations and circumstances that reach beyond the physical walls of the school. Sorry. Yeah, some examples of the breadth where you see uh, in the smaller image um, the uh, pictures from the process of the students and the news image in the, in the background. Um, despite the situatedness of the, cre the creative process, the strict format followed to represent its final outcome has starkly dictated the way in which the work, its makers, and their meaning have, have been perceived. For almost two decades, um, 
the final projects from Design Academy Eindhoven have been edited down, sometimes taking out crucial elements of the design outcome and staged by only a handful of professional photographers against a backdrop of an anonymous empty real estate settings devoid of any real interaction, underplaying the role of technology in a growing number of design projects. So you can see that here in the iPads laying on a concrete floor, just uh, screens lit up, but without there being any real interactions. The, cons the contrast, the lack of real, real human world relations we used in year, year and context to provide space for the process and circumstances behind the work. For this, we selected the most important news event that happened during the 2011, 2012, and organized them both chronolog chronologically and visually, creating a fluent backdrop of changing plans. However, right before the deadline to get the book printed, a fear of copyright infringement put this part of the project on hold. So you're actually the first ones to see these spreads uh, come about. Um, this issue of fair use became much more apparent in the second case um, um, when images remain, which is a visual polemic in eight acts. Um, and it's a much more recent project. Um, in which the context surrounding pre-existing images, which are these glass lantern slides from the heritage collection of the Tio Delves, uh, were mixed with prints and images used in a mandatory visual communication course in the master program designed for interaction at the Faculty of Industrial Design Engineering. And these images play a central role. Marked as heritage, um, one of the few cultural areas unaffected by the budget cuts of the state secretary, Hall Bezelster, which I mentioned before, and the historical importance of TU Delft's collection of glass slides as a whole was already established. The slides were used for educational purposes between 1900 and 1950. Yet as single slides, their relevance and specific contribution towards this whole was less clear. Most of the context in which the individual images gained uh, their meaning uh, are unknown. They are snapshots in a time which continues uh, irrevocably. But does this make their design less meaningful? Yeah. Here you see what wasn't possible with the state of technology and regulations regarding the use, usage of pre-existing images in year in context, the publication I showed at first in 2012, has become a new alternative reality to ask um, to be questioned and, and to be questioned extensively. So how does a lack of contextual awareness influence the way in which design is understood as meaningful? This is only a start. So here you see a little bit of the process where actually the context around the images of which we do not know in which context they were, where most of the images were made. And we also don't know why they were collected and why these images were preserved. We only know they're part of a collection that cannot be thrown away like the dresses mentioned earlier. Um, here they are recontextualized in a new AI generated setting. And the overall image of these 192 slides, um, yeah. it uh, is now uh, an exhibition um, that yet yeah, you have to imagine this is 56 centimeters high and about uh, six meters wide. So I will not show the entire thing. Um, but rapidly go through it. And we'll end saying this is part of the ongoing research. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so our final paper today, already, <laughs> um, Lightning Talks, is by Michaela Bonomo, a doctoral candidate in the Laboratory of History and Theory of Architecture. Michaela's research is a critique of the building typology and the ideology of the villa in Italy in the post-war period. And she investigates concepts of privilege, domesticity, ecology, and subject production. Her talk today looks at villas on display in Italy in 1933 and 1964. Um, Michaela, are you presenting live or do you want me to share your pre-recorded video? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hello, hi. Um, maybe better to play the video just in case the connection is a bit environmental. 
Sure, okay. Everybody. Let me know Thank if it's you. working. Okay, sure. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Michaela Bonomo. Thank you very much for having me today at DHS Student Forum. So has it been introduced? I will be presenting today a short extract of my PhD thesis, which I'm carrying out in Lausanne in Switzerland. And the title of the presentation is Constructing the Dream, Villas on Display in Italy, 1933 and 1964. So in my PhD thesis, I look at the typology of the villa or holiday villa to be more precise, which is a building that is not new. It's been around for centuries. It was invented in the Roman times. And I actually borrow um, the definition that the Roman had of the holiday villa as Villa Maritima or Villa Suburbana, which is a building that has three main characteristics. It's intended solely as a pleasure villa, it's devoid of any productive element, and it's often located on the coast by the sea. In my PhD dissertation, I actually look at the 30 years following the Second World Conflict, and I analyze five case studies of famous architects to tackle different themes that I believe were, are characteristic in the typology of the holiday villa. It's also a criticism of the proliferation of holiday villas in the post-war period, and in the first chapter, I look at villas through media, through movies, exhibitions, and publications. And today I will be looking at a subchapter. The subchapter focuses on two exhibitions, one of which was actually not held during in the post-war period, but in the during the fascist regime, so the 1930s, at the Triennale of Milan, which is a very famous institution by now. And it held it's located in the Palazzo dell'Arte. The first exhibition was held in 1933, entitled Stile Civiltà. So this exhibition was uh, held during the fascist regime, and it actually had uh, exhibitors from all over the world. But what I'm focusing on is not what was exhibited within the Palazzo dell'Arte, but outside of it. It is, in fact, the first time that pavilions, one-to-one -one prototypes, are built in the garden of, or Palazzo Sempione surrounding the Palazzo dell'Arte. They presented a, a wide range of different groups, uh, of different views of architecture uh, by different groups of architects. And I will focus on the five holiday villas pavilion built um, and that you can see at the top of this map. Joe Ponti, who was the chief editor of the architecture magazine Domus at the time, celebrated these five holiday villas, which in his mind was symbolizing an alternative to the bourgeois villa. In fact, they were meant to be intended as prototype, easily reproducible for their innovative building system. They all shared common traits, they had a very simple plan, a front garden, veranda, and the application of the latest technology. And they were meant to also be built in different contexts on the, of the Italian peninsula, so the hillside, lakeside, mountain villa, seaside villa, or countryside villa, as you can see here. In my dissertation, I look more closely at the comparison between these different buildings, but what I wanted to highlight today is that each of these buildings were in fact a build, like, a build on their own. They had all a uh, manual where the different instructions of assembling and disassembling were pre presented, and they were meant to be very easily reproducible. They were also built with prefabrication, uh, tech, with prefabricated uh, latest technology. And uh, in certain cases, they could also be quite complex, like in the case of the seaside villa, which was actually on two floors, suggesting a potential view towards the seaside. And this building were actually built, assembled and disassembled. So they only lived for the space of the exhibition. But as Flavia Mar Marcello has argued, the fifth triennial exhibition was to showcase this pavilion as a physical manifestation of an idealized lifestyle, as this architecture cemented the position of a new ruling middle class and offered a sense of opportunity to workers wanting to improve their lives. And in fact, uh, with the period I'm looking at, the economic miracle, social mobility allowed more families uh, to enjoy a, a level of prosperity never enjoyed before. And the period I look for, I look at, which is 30 years, I also argue that during this period there was a proliferation of holiday villas, and in a way it was part of an implicit state government project, 
one of, one of which was characterized by three main strategies, which were, I argue, uh, put forward for, uh, for the government of the Christian Democratic that were ruling the country, which were a support of the low-tech construction sector, opposition to regional master plan, which basically meant that until the mid 80s, people could build pretty much everywhere on the peninsula without any restrictions and support of the home ownership policies for families. This is obviously a simplification of what happened, but in a nutshell, more families were able to, to dream of a villa and to potentially build one. And this was also possible, obviously, to the network of infrastructure that started um, to capi capillary connect all the most remote corners of the peninsula, allowing more families, thanks to the developed welfare state, to enjoy a holiday during the seaside, sea, at the seaside during uh, their vacation. And it is this is the main topic of the second exhibition I'm looking at, the 1964-13 Triennale of Milan dedicated to leisure or Tempo Libero. This exhibition is entirely dedicated to how the work life of people is divided into um, leisure and work, work time. But also it is an inner criticism in this exhibition and on how the, the holiday has also obviously prompted more construction. There was, in this, as you see in this corner, a criticism uh, on the, the proliferation of buildings and speculation on the coastline, motivated mainly by the race towards the sea, by the way in which the sea is now seen as an enjoyable uh, natural force, as an enjoyable and tamed natural force in a way. And the garden of the Trinale di Milano are still uh, for this exhibition hosting temporary pavilions and again villas are still prefabricated villas, uh, which uh, is a, a technology that continued to be at the center of theoretical speculations, especially in the end of the 60s, the offering of new materials was further expanded, raising the concrete possibility of movable and expandable unit, such as, for example, these two units I'm looking at here, the Casa Prefabricata per Vacantes, so holiday homes, where you see a grid easily rep replicatable and also it's constructible following a modular grid of 90 by 90, entirely made of timber with paneling uh, of concrete panels. Or Casa Natura, nature house, which had to adapt to the different condition of the landscape. And the critics that I'm posing here, really concluding my presentation, is that there is a huge and visible contradiction between the intention of promoting prefabricated models within these exhibitions and the reality of the Italian construction industry, which was much more fragmented and was actually favoring small to medium firms, bespoke construction, and especially in the construction of villa, we see an experimentation, which is a constant in villa typology of new technology, of pushing boundary, of baseball construction, which is extremely uh, different and um, less sustainable than the prefabricated models exhibited in uh, the two or three annales. And another harsh reality, which I tackle in my thesis, it's the impact of uh, villas on the landscape. An extreme relationship with the landscape, which was only possible due to the lack of planning policies, which would have protected the most beautiful coastal area of construction. So the villa is seen here in my thesis as a main form of colonization of the coast, paving the way for the following forms of urbanization to come. And to conclude, both Rinaldi's exhibitions, so the architectural exhibition is a genre that can function under different political regimes but nevertheless promoting and showcasing the architectonic possibilities of one particular building type, the villa. The type in fact remained the same, what changed was the way in which it was represented, but at the same time, both editions of the Triennale can be considered as a mixture between political propaganda shows, fairs promoting the building industry, and more sophisticated exhibition of architectonic invention. And I would conclude that in both Triennale, the representation of architecture, and in this case, the representation of the holiday villa, but not architecture itself, was challenged inside the Trinale, but not outside of it. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions and comments.